Hey everybody, welcome back. We are now to the fun part in our journey towards understanding more about performance-based liquefaction hazard analysis. And we, we've covered a lot of the background stuff so that you can understand all of the numerous sources of uncertainty that contribute to the problem of liquefaction hazard assessment. Everything from predicting where, when, how big an earthquake is going to be, and then given an earthquake, what types of ground motions we'll experience at our site, and how those ground motions will be affected by things like local site conditions, like site response. Understanding, um, even given the, uh, a scenario level of ground shaking, um, the uncertainty of whether the soil is going to liquefy or not, and the uncertainty related to if we've characterized the, um, the geotechnical properties, or, or namely the in situ penetration resistance, like the CPT or the SPT resistance properly. All of those things, um, well, and, and also then predicting uh, the uncertainty or, or quantifying the uncertainty related to predicting various effects from soil liquefaction. So we have tons of uncertainty in these problems. And you can understand why when we make calculations, liquefaction hazard calculations, in a scenario-based manner, we're potentially missing a whole lot of, of potential wiggle room for how things could really turn out. And, and that leads us to this topic of performance-based liquefaction hazard assessment. To give you a little bit of background on my uh, qualifications and experience with this topic, I did my initial graduate research at the University of Washington under uh, Dr. Stephen Kramer, who is uh, highly regarded and recognized as one of the pioneers of performance-based earthquake engineering in geotechnical engineering. And, and I helped pioneer and work on the application of performance-based methods to the prediction of lateral spread displacement. From there, I've moved into uh, applying it to the prediction of liquefaction triggering and then into the prediction of volumetric free field strains or settlements. Um, and then Newmark sliding block assessments uh, and, and on and on. And so I've been working on this problem for about uh, 16 years now. And uh, it's a topic that I'm very passionate about. Now, a lot of people have heard about performance-based earthquake engineering, but they don't really understand what it is. And so um, I, in this lecture, we're going to move through uh, just some of the basic ideas of what performance-based engineering is. And then uh, I'll give you some application or, or an example demonstration of the benefit of a performance-based liquefaction hazard approach. So let's just dive right into it. If I'm looking at liquefaction hazard analysis, there's various ways that I can quantify the seismic loading for that liquefaction hazard assessment. One of those ways is what uh, I call the deterministic or the scenario based approach. For this deterministic approach, it is going to consider each possible seismic source and each possible ground motion from each of those seismic sources individually as a standalone, independent, and very possible scenario. It will usually assume the mean values for the inputs and the models with the exception of the liquefaction triggering. Typically for that, we're looking at the 84th percentile that corresponds to the deterministic CRR boundary that's recommended by most of the published models that are out there today. So this is the deterministic approach. And, and notice that there's really no uh, explicit consideration of any of those uncertainties we talked about in this type of approach. A second type of approach, and, and one that is much more common in engineering practice today, is what has been termed by others 
to be the pseudo-probabilistic approach. And with the pseudo-probabilistic approach, this approach considers probabilistic ground motions, uh, but it only considers them from a single return period. So in other words, we're going to take probabilistic ground motions, but we're going to analyze them in a deterministic manner. So it's almost like taking a screw, putting it up to a wall, putting a hammer to it, and pounding the screw into the wall. That's, that's what the pseudo-probabilistic approach is. When we analyze a single return period, we're usually going to take inputs from the, um, from the deaggregation at that return period we're interested in. Um, sometimes we'll take the mean values, other times we'll take the modal values, more commonly the modal values, and um, we can, we like the deterministic, we can assume a larger percentile, like the 84th percentile of things, if we want to for critical projects. Finally, there's a third approach. This is the probabilistic or the performance-based approach. In this approach, we're going to consider the probabilistic ground motions not from just one return period, but we're going to consider the ground motions from all return periods. It's going to also explicitly account for parametric and model uncertainties. And the results that we report, the results that we use in design, are going to depend on our acceptable or our desired hazard level of return period that uh, we're basing our designs upon. So um, a lot of this lecture, we're going to zero in on the approach that most engineers use today. This is the pseudo-probabilistic approach. And, and I'm not going to try to fool any of you. It's my intention to completely obliterate and nuke this method out of the water. And, and I hope that what I present to you today will, will convince you that this approach really is a bad, undesirable approach. Uh, let's get in and try to understand why. So from the pseudo-probabilistic approach, we need a scenario acceleration and a magnitude to analyze liquefaction because that's what the pseudo-probabilistic approach is. We're doing a deterministic assessment but with probabilistic ground motions. So as I said before, we're typically going to go to a deaggregation analysis. So here's um, some old USGS deaggregation output for a return period uh, of 24, 75 years. I think that's what that is. That might, this might be the 475 year return period. Um, and now with a 0.54 G acceleration, this is probably the 2475 return year, or uh, year return period for a site in downtown San Diego. Now a couple of things that we can see here. There's a mean magnitude of 6.81, which corresponds to the average of all of these different columns. Note that we have magnitude uh, in this set of axes, and we have source to site distance in this set of axes, and then we have the percent contribution in, the, in this axis right here. So if we took the average magnitude of all the different columns, that gives us this mean magnitude of 6.81. Now the modal magnitude corresponds to the magnitude of the tallest column on the deaggregation. And, and that, in this case, would correspond to a 6.64 modal magnitude. So if I compare the difference between the mean and the modal magnitudes for this site in San Diego, they're not uh, substantially different. They're quite similar. Now, if I look at a different site, say a site right on the Ohio River in the central uh, part of the United States, downtown Cincinnati, same return period, 2475 years, much smaller acceleration as we'd expect, 0 0.07 G's, very, very small. Uh, but check out now the mean and the modal magnitude. The mean magnitude here is a 6.3, but the modal is a 7.7. .7.
massively different. So there's, there's a huge difference in potential here of, of different scenario events that we could choose. Do we choose the mean event or do we choose the modal event for our magnitude? And depending on where we're located, it can make a huge difference. So here are the basic steps associated with this conventional pseudo-probabilistic approach where we're going to perform a PSHA or we're going to go to the USGS, who has already performed the PSHA for us. And from the PGA, PSHA, we're going to uh, do de-aggregation analysis and go to the return period of interest and, and grab that de-aggregation, usually corresponding to the 2475 year return period corresponding to the MCE. Now that would be for buildings, for um, highways, and uh, retaining walls for transportation structures, we'd be using the 1,033 year return period. For most, that is. Okay, then from that deaggregation, we're either going to use the mean or the, um, not the median, the modal, the modal magnitude from the deaggregation analysis. So you have to pick, and as you can see for, from our previous example, that that, that could result in, in some pretty different possible outcomes in your liquefaction hazard assessment. And you're going to couple those, uh, that, ma that magnitude that you select from the deaggregation with the probabilistic PGA. So now you have a, 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 a mac, an Amax and a magnitude pair. You're going to correct that PGA from the deaggregation uh, for site response effects. You can use either site amplification factors from the code, or you can do your own site response analysis, doing something like deep soil or um, uh, any of those equivalent uh, site response codes, and, and do your own site response analysis to convert this bedrock PGA motion to a ground surface on the soil ground motion that we'll call A max. Now we're going to couple the A max with either the mean or the modal magnitude that we selected from step two. And we're going to analyze those in a deterministic liquefaction triggering assessment. And then typically we're going to define liquefaction triggering as a probability of liquefaction of 15% um, with a factor of safety ranging from 1.2 to 1.3. Okay. Now, by the way, that probability of liquefaction of 15% would correspond to a factor of safety of 1.0. If we increase that factor of safety up to a 1.2 or a 1.3, the probability of liquefaction uh, is right around 1% actually, that we're calling liquefied. That's a topic for another day, but it, it is a, a gross uh, example of over-conservatism in our discipline, and it's something that, that really should be addressed. Um, I have another lecture on my Office Hours YouTube page where I talk specifically about this issue um, and, and I strongly recommend you go check it out if you're interested in that. Okay, I want to give a real example. It's story time, so get your cuddly blanket and your milk and cookies out and sit down and uh, listen to a story that I'm going to share. And this story involves uh, a good friend and a hero of mine a hero in the sense that uh, he's a very accomplished engineer. He's in the National Academy of Engineers. This is uh, Professor Emeritus T. Leslie Yowd. And uh, for anyone that's even remotely associated with the earthquake engineering community, you would know that Professor Yowd is one of the pioneers in the geotechnical earthquake engineering field, uh, particularly related to soil liquefaction. Now, Professor Yowd uh, one day knocked on my door when I was uh, maybe in my second year of being a professor. 
so this was around 2013, and he uh, he I opened the door and he was standing there, and and I was kind of shocked and surprised and invited him in, and after some pleasant chit chat, he said, "I have a problem," and I said, "Oh," and he said, "And I think you can help me. I've been told that that you know how to do." probabilistic liquefaction hazard analysis or PLHA and I said yes it's something I've been trained on it's it's the same as performance based engineering and he said okay and and then he started to share with me some details and he said I have a site I've been approached by a client who's building a large industrial facility near Cincinnati Ohio right on the Ohio River and um, it has a soil profile that looks something like this where we can see down to about 22 meters we can see that it's very coarse grain material with varying uh, amounts of fines and uh, for the most part the fines range anywhere from about five blow counts up to about 30 blow counts per foot uh, corrected SPT blow counts. Um, in this field, it looks like we have one little layer where they must have hit a cobble or something that was really, really high. But for, for the most part, this soil is loose to medium dense. And you can see it's very saturated that the water table is uh, at a depth of less than two meters at this site. Now, um, analyzing this site for liquefaction, the engineers determined that they had a major problem and here's why those engineers analyzing that site for liquefaction they applied the pseudo probabilistic method they went to the USGS they got the deaggregation for that site that corresponds to a 24 75 year event and as we saw before the PGA was 0.067 and as we saw before, we had the choice of doing a magnitude 6.3 for a mean magnitude or a modal magnitude of 7.7. .7. Now, most engineers, if they're faced with the choice of, of do I have a low or a high magnitude event to choose from, almost every engineer is going to choose the high magnitude event because they've been taught to be conservative at a nearly every step along the way. So picking a magnitude 7.7, .7, that's uh, going to correspond to a new Madrid seismic event uh, that, that is associated with these circled bins here. These represent these, these magnitudes, as you can see, that range from magnitudes of 7 to about 8. Those events correspond to a new Madrid event that is located uh, between 450 to 500 kilometers away from the site. So very, very far away. So by using the acceleration of 0 0.07 G's with a 7.7 .7 magnitude, when they analyzed liquefaction triggering and the resulting free-filled volumetric strain settlements, this is what they predicted for their site using that pseudo probabilistic method. And uh, this little blue line shown right here corresponds to a, a factor of safety of 1.2, which we consider to be the threshold or the, the conservative boundary for defining liquefaction in the soil. And you can see that we're predicting on the order of, of about 23 centimeters of settlement. That's about 10 inches, just under a foot. And that was determined by the engineers for the site to be unacceptable. And as a result, they were recommending to the owner that uh, ground improvement needed to be installed at this site. This was a, a very large industrial site. And that was going to increase the cost of this project by tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Ground improvement is very, very expensive depending on the amount that you need to install.
So the owners obviously weren't very happy about this. So they went and they retained the father of soil liquefaction, Professor Yaud, and hired him to see if he could make the problem go away. Now, Professor Yaud analyzed this problem just like we did here. The difference, though, is he looked at this and he went back to this deaggregation and he said, oh man, this site is so far away from that earthquake. I just, my instinct tells me that this site will not experience soil liquefaction. Therefore, he looked at this and he said, no, I do not agree with this analysis. And he waved his hand and that was enough for the engineer and that was enough for the owner and they ran with it. Now, he can do that because he's T. Leslie Yaud. For the rest of us, we can't do that and we need to prove this on paper. But this is why Professor Yaud came and he said, I can't prove on paper what my gut is telling me is correct and it's bothering me. And so I'm wondering if there's something you can do to help me. And so I got pretty curious and I said, okay, let me ask a simple question. How likely is it that a magnitude 7.5 or a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake occurring at more than 450 kilometers away produces an acceleration of 0 0.07 G's at your site? This is just a very simple question. And Professor Yao agreed. He said, that is a good question. Let's figure it out. So we went to several ground motion prediction equations for the central and eastern portions of the United States. We plugged in this earthquake, this source to site distance, and we saw what ground motion came out of it. And what we saw was for uh, the Toro and others method in 1997 published, the PGA of 0.067 G had less than a 1% chance of being that large. And looking at a different model, we saw using the Atkinson and Bohr 2006 model, it was less than a 2% chance that the PGA would be as large as 0.067 G. That told us something, that we were creating a Frankenstein earthquake that didn't really exist. So that leads to the problems that I have with the pseudo-probabilistic approach. The first problem is it can be very difficult to select the appropriate acceleration and magnitude pair to use. Do we use the mean magnitude? Do we use the modal magnitude? Now in areas like downtown San Diego, where the mean and the modal magnitude are about the same, it's not that, that's not that critical of an issue. But when I get to areas of low to moderate seismicity, like uh, Ohio, it becomes a very big issue. And it can be very difficult to select an appropriate PGA and magnitude pair. Now, uh, also, this PGA and magnitude pair, they're typically taken from one, a single return period. But all the other return periods, like 475 years, 1,000 years, uh, 1,500 years, 3,000 years, 5,000 years, all those different return periods and their possible ground motions and likelihoods, they're ignored. So we're only looking, we're putting all of our eggs into the basket of one return period. This approach, uh, because it's deterministic in nature, it does not rigorously account for uncertainty. Uncertainty in the ground motions, uncertainty in the, um, the site response, uncertainty in the input parametric parameters, uncertainty in the uh, triggering model itself or the effects from liquefaction. It doesn't account for uncertainty and that can be very significant. And finally and perhaps most significantly in my opinion, one of the most dangerous problems with the pseudo-probabilistic approach is that it contributes
to an inaccurate interpretation of the liquefaction hazard. For example, I've often heard this from engineers who apply the pseudo-probabilistic method. Quote, I used the 2475-year PGA in my analysis. So, my liquefaction results correspond to the 2475-year liquefaction return period, right? And the answer to that is wrong. It doesn't. No. It's because all of these uncertainties that contribute to the liquefaction problem were not considered at all, and they contribute significantly to that return period. That leads us to performance-based earthquake engineering. This idea started up in the late 90s, was, um, was thought up by some pretty clever structural engineers uh, and, and policy makers out of California. And they really had some interesting questions. Namely, if I have a hospital built right here, I'm trying to make like a red cross, but anyway, you get the point. I have a hospital located right here. And I have built next to it Joe's Crab Shack. Should I be required to design these buildings to the same functionality? In other words, do these two buildings serve the same functionality to society? The obvious answer to this is no. The hospital serves a much more critical role to society than Joe's Crab Shack. Well, I, I guess that depends on how much you like crab. But if you're like most people, you would agree that the hospital is, is much more important to society in general. And so why is it then that the only difference between these two buildings in code is the occupancy In other words, the code treats these two buildings the same, and it's designing these buildings for collapse prevention and for life safety. But what if we want the hospital to be more than just n not collapsed after the earthquake? What if we want it to be operational? and up and running and helping save injured people and save their lives. Yeah, you would think that we would want to have the option to design that building to a higher level of performance. But it gets even, it gets even more fun than that. What if, for instance, Joe, who runs Joe's Crab Shack, is a very concerned business owner? And the last thing he wants is to have his building collapse, or I'm sorry, to, to be dysfunctional after an earthquake. After all, it's his family's business. It's his livelihood. What if Joe wants to invest money so that his building can be designed and constructed to be operational after the MCE event? Should he have the say and the ability to be able to request that of the engineers. And of course, the answer to that question, in my opinion, is yes. He should be able to request that, rather than requiring all owners to comply with the same standard of collapse prevention and um, life safety. So that brings us to the performance-based earthquake engineering um, integral. Now, the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, or PEER, is a research center that's based out of Berkeley in California. And uh, in the early 2000s, 
they took these concepts of performance-based earthquake engineering and all of the different uncertainties associated with it and they wrapped them all into a single equation. And that equation has become known as the infamous pure triple integral. And you see it here. Now, now before you turn your screens off and go running in horror from such a scary equation, I'll show you that um, these terms in this equation aren't that scary. They're not really not that bad. For instance, we have what's called the IMs. This is intensity measure. So this is a quantitative measure of how strong the earthquake shaking is. So this could be considered like a ground motion parameter. We have EDPs, which stands for engineering demand parameter. And this is a quantity of how much demand is placed on our built infrastructure due to the intensity measure. We have damage measure, or DM, which is a quantitative measure of how much damage is inflicted on our infrastructure from the demand placed upon it from the intensity measure. And then given the amount of damage to our structure, we have DV, which stands for decision variable, which is a, an objective, a predictable, a logical, a repeatable decision based on quantified damage from quantified demand conditional upon some intensity measure that occurred from the earthquake. So now you can see how the idea of a performance-based approach is we're taking all of the different conditionalities and we're stringing them together in a chain of probabilities. And we're considering all of those probabilities jointly along with their corresponding uncertainties. So some examples of intensity measure might be, say, peak ground acceleration, PGA, that then uh, could be used perhaps to predict some amount of lateral spreading displacement at a site. And given lateral spreading displacement, that might cause uh, pile foundations in a bridge to deflect. So we have pile deflection of a bridge abutment, and then the repair cost given the pile deflection of the bridge abutments. And then decision makers can be basing their opinions or their decisions off of um, these decision variables like those ones based in cost, like repair cost. So geotechnical engineers, we, we typically um, avoid this half of the triple integral. Okay, We don't deal with damage measures, we don't deal with decision variables, but our domain focuses specifically on the engineering demand and the intensity measures. So that's where we're going to focus right now. So we're going to just break out this portion of the equation to get the hazard curves for the engineering demand parameters. As it relates to liquefaction, um, Steve Kramer and Roy Mayfield in 2007 published a, a pioneering and, and a very important paper called the Return Period of Soil Liquefaction in the ASCE Journal of Geotechnical and Geoenvironmental Engineering. In this approach, they demonstrated how the equation, going back one slide, this equation right here could be used in the liquefaction sense to produce hazard curves of liquefaction factor of safety or uh, a term that they introduced called N required for every layer in the soil profile. Now, you may be wondering what N required is, and, and I'll do a quick uh, crash course for that. Everybody by now should be familiar with these types of terms, um, SPT um, N160 clean sand. Okay, so everyone should be familiar with these types of terms, uh, these plots where we have the CRR curve, we have the zone that's liquefied, we have the zone that's non-liquefied, and we have the CRR function. Now, let's say you're analyzing a soil layer, that soil layer falls right here, 
So in other words, it has um, what we'll call uh, N site. That's the SPT resistance for that one soil layer we're talking about. And of course, it has its corresponding CSR as well for that layer. And traditionally, what we've done is um, we have, for this N site value, we've grabbed the corresponding CRR for that layer. I'll just call it CRR site to be consistent. And we've computed the factor of safety as the um, resistance, the CRR site, divided by the CSR site. And that's how we have um, quantified factor of safety for that soil layer. Okay, So in this instance, you would see that CRR is greater than CSR, so hence factor of safety would be greater than 1. Um, Kramer and Mayfield introduced a different concept, and they said, whoops, don't want to do that. They said, what if um, for this given CSR site, we looked at the CRR that would be um, the CRR at which the factor of safety would be equal to 1, or the CRR that would just get that um, soil liquefying with a factor of safety of 1 right at that CSR. And what N value would that correspond to? So the N value that corresponds to the CRR of a given CSR is what is called N required. And it, think of it as the SPT resistance that would be required to prevent liquefaction given this level of seismic loading, this CSR. And because our soil layer has a blow count that is greater than the blow count required to prevent liquefaction, we know that the layer will not liquefy. Now, if it so happened that our point was over here instead, same CSR, but now we have a different end value, we have a different end site, you can see end site is less than end required, and therefore uh, we would predict liquefaction at this site. They also introduced the term called delta NL, which was simply end site minus N required. And if delta N was negative, it implies liquefaction. Now that's for SPT resistance. You could see that we could do the exact same thing, but instead of using SPT N, we could use CPT Q C1 N C S and we could have Q required instead of N required if we wanted to. Okay, but back to the work by Kramer and Mayfield. What they showed was um, you could take uh, those principles of performance-based earthquake engineering and integrate through all possible combinations of magnitude and um, acceleration for all return periods, assess um, the possibility of exceeding uh, or not exceeding all possible values of factors of safety weighted according to their probabilities, and develop hazard curves that might look something like this. This approach was groundbreaking, and it won them a major award, the, the Norman Medal from ASCE for, for that year for the best paper published by ASCE. Um, and and it, it was worthy of that because this is a very pioneering and an exciting approach for liquefaction triggering. Now, a few years later, uh, I did work with Professor Kramer, and, and we did a, a similar thing, but this time for lateral spread displacement, where this time it's the, the probability of displacement exceeding some given displacement, given our site terms, and given our seismic loading. 
and considering all probabilistic values of seismic loading. So using the same type of performance-based approach, we can develop hazard curves for lateral spread displacements at the ground surface. And the research I did used the Yaud and Bartlett and um, Hansen model uh, for the lateral spread prediction. Now, let's go back to this problem we were looking at with Professor Yaud at that facility in uh, near Cincinnati, Ohio. When uh, I analyze the site, like the engineers, like Professor Yaud, using the pseudo-probabilistic approach, this is what I got, just like they did. But when I used a performance-based liquefaction and settlement approach, um, using the same triggering model, Boulanger and Idris, and using the same settlement, the Ishihara and Yoshimini model, when I did that performance-based model, according to the Kramer and Mayfield approach, this is what I got for a 24-75 year return period. Now, I've never seen a 75-year-old man about do a backflip, but, but that was about the first day I've ever seen that. Professor Yaud, when he saw these results, said, I'm a believer. This is important. We need this in practice. And he became a very strong proponent for a performance-based liquefaction hazard approach from that point on. And what you can see is a massive difference in our predicted factors of safety and our free-filled volumetric strain settlements. And the only difference between these two approaches was how we considered our seismic loading and our uncertainties. We used the same models, Boulanger and Idris, and Ishihara and Yoshimini, but in the performance-based approach, we considered the ground motions, the probabilistic ground motions, in a probabilistic manner, and we incorporated all the uncertainties in the problem, and when we did that and we quantified the real risks of liquefaction, not the assumed ones that come with the conventional approach. When we did that for this site, we predicted very small settlements, like less than half an inch in, in this case. So hopefully you've gotten a flavor for the power and the benefit of a performance-based liquefaction hazard analysis approach. The problem is, and I'm going to make a prediction, when you saw the, those triple integrals, when you saw all of those summations in the Kramer and Mayfield formulas and in the formulas for the lateral spread displacement, your jaw probably hit the ground and you thought, there's no way I'm going to apply this in my everyday practice. It's not practical. And you're right. Without special tools, it isn't practical. And that's why, through this research that I'm summarizing here, my team of students followed the lead of some very um, notable engineers and researchers, and we built and developed a series of simplified performance-based liquefaction hazard analysis methods that closely approximate the results of a full performance-based analysis, but with only a fraction of the calculations required. And, and these approaches are very easy and practical to apply on everyday projects. And I will talk about them in the next lecture. Thank you. Have a great one.